Mark J. Dunkelman's book, The Vanishing Neighbor, confronts an avoidable, unavoidable truth in our current society, that we could connect with someone across the globe while not knowing the name of our next-door neighbor or even elected representative. In the book's three distinct sections, he outlines the origins of community erosion, its current manifestations, and what we as a nation can do to change it. Mr. Dunkelman is a research fellow at Brown University's A. Alfred Taubman Center for Public Policy and a senior fellow at the Clinton Foundation. His writing has appeared in our very own Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, Political, Politico, and National Affairs. I really can't wait to hear what he has to say tonight, so will you all please join me in welcoming Arche Dunkelman. Well, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, we moved, uh, we moved from Washington to Providence over Labor Day, so uh, it's uh, it's a thrill to be back and to uh, visit with friends and uh, uh, bring, bring the mic up a little bit. How's that? Better? Good. So this is a, a book that I wrote uh, for my wife, but uh, I actually wrote it to my father. <laughs> and let me tell you why. Uh, during the dozen years that I lived here, uh, I'd fly home to Buffalo uh, with some frequency. Every time I was there, at some point or another, he would turn to me and ask, what are you guys doing down there? <laughs> and it was a, a question that, uh, that seems fairly, fairly, fairly uh, reasonable at a moment when most of America is pretty, uh, pretty done with Washington. Um, and the question, um, uh, uh, prompts you to, to go through a very common litany of explanations for why Washington is broken. We all know the typical litany that, uh, that there's too much money in politics, that gerrymandering has ruined the House, that the filibuster has ruined the Senate, uh, that lobbyists have overrun America, that, uh, that, that well, it often comes back right back to money. And the interesting thing as I would go through and explain this to my father each time with a different explanation that I hoped would satisfy him and never did, was that in each case, the phenomenon was something that existed before Washington broke. Money has always been around in politics. 1916, Pierre DuPont gave nearly $100,000 to Woodrow Wilson's opponent simply because he supported an income tax. So this is not a new phenomenon. Jerry Mandarin is named after Elbridge Jerry, who was a James Madison's vice president. Uh, the filibuster, yeah, we filibuster more frequently, but it's not because the rules have changed, it's just that senators are now more inclined to filibuster. So I wanted to go back and try to figure out what actually happened. So let me, let me hold back that, hold that thought and, and, and I will try to come back to it. When I was five, we moved from Cincinnati to Buffalo away from my grandparents and my family. And I noticed something each time we visited Cincinnati again, which was that when I drove up and down the streets of Cincinnati with my parents, the streets where they'd grown up, they could name each and every person in each house. They could name who they were, what the kids were like, where the parents worked, what they'd done, where the kids had gone to college. And when I went back to Buffalo, and I w went up and down my own street, I couldn't name a single member of, the, that, of, of uh, a single neighbor who didn't have a kid in my public elementary school class. It was sort of a, it was a very jarring distinction. So I began to wonder what, what had happened. And more than that, I began to wonder, as my father would ask me each time I came back from Washington, was there some connection between what was happening in a, my social life versus his that could explain what was happening in Washington. So bear with me as I try to explain to you a, a, the a different theory of the case. Imagine your own social lives on a diagram that looks like the rings of Saturn. Imagine that you're the planet and that every person you know and interact with is on one of the rings that extend out from the from the planet. So your closest and most intimate ties are the inner rings, 
people that you know, the, the barista that you met at Starbucks two days earlier is in the outermost ring, and everybody else is placed somewhere on the continuum in between. What I think uh, has happened is that today, Americans are making a different set of choices. It's the first third of my book. I'm not going to go through exactly why we're making these choices. But I think for the first time in American history, Americans are taking more of their time and attention and investing them in the innermost rings, so the people that they love most, and the outermost rings, so people who share their sensibility about politics or root for the same football team. And what's been lost are the relationships in the middle, what I call the middle rings. So when Robert Putnam wrote Bowling Alone, what he was talking about were these middle ring relationships, bowling leagues, PTAs, neighbors. What I want to stress here, because this conversation when people talk about community often turns on the issue of whether there's more or less. I don't think that's a, that's a great way to think about it. I think the better way to think about it is that we are making different choices individually. We're, and, and, and we are building different kinds of community. So when people say community is declining and someone else says, well, no, I'm now in touch with a whole variety of people who are on Facebook or on Twitter or uh, whatever their, their new connection is, that's, that's authentic. That's, that is community. And I, I, I think we should be very careful not to diminish it. But it is different. So let me try now, quickly, to come back to the core question, which is, why is Washington broken? Middle ring relationships are unique. They are unique in American history. And they're unique in world history. 20 years ago, one of my colleagues at Brown, Gordon, uh, 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 <laughs> Gordon Wood, Gordon Wood wrote a, wrote a book called The Radicalism of the American Revolution. And the argument was that in the late 1700s, Americans weren't eager to secede simply because they wanted liberty or they were angry about taxes or whatnot. His argument was that Americans had developed a very different way of organizing their communities. And it wasn't the top-down sort of manifestation that you see in something like Downton Abbey, where people are class-oriented and there's an upper class and a lower class and a working class. In America, we organized ourselves in what Tocqueville called townships. Namely, we were, and this is more true in New England than in the South, but as a broad generalization, we were organized in such a way that people from different stations in life with different backgrounds were all situated in the same place, they were talking to one another, and even when they didn't agree on things, they couldn't help but interact. They couldn't help but meet each other, talk about whatever the current crisis was. Tocqueville noted that the, that the, that the issue was that power flowed from the bottom up in the United States and from the top down in Europe. And it's gotten lost in a lot of Tocqueville's of the scholarship about Tocqueville in the, in the years that have been lost. But he identifies this as a key distinc distinction between American society and European society. Those township relationships, that's what I term them in, term them in the book, are really born in the middle rings. Those are middle ring relationships. Those are people that are not, you, you, you aren't extremely close with people who are in the middle rings, but you know enough about them to know what they think about a lot of the world. You know enough about them to know if they went to a certain school or their parents are sick or their, their children are having trouble in algebra, whatever it is. And that it was in those relationships that people began to have an appreciation when they didn't agree for the other person's point of view. That's not something that happened only on Capitol Hill. It's not something that happened between powerful Democrats and powerful Republicans. It was something that happened in the course of an individual's everyday life. My view is that without that foundation, without that community structure, it's very hard to have the kind of political system that we have today. It's very hard if you don't know in the course of your everyday life someone who holds a different view, if you don't have the experience of going to a coffee shop and you're a small business person 
and you see somebody who's a, who's an academic and you're on opposite sides of a political divide, if you don't have that experience of talking over a political issue or, or having the experience of, of, of having, of having uh, interacted enough to know, even if you don't agree, the other person isn't crazy. It's very hard for you to stomach the idea that your member of Congress, that your senator, that your state senator would go to whatever legislative body and take a position that is antithetical to your own, or that they would compromise with someone who seems to have a different principled position. So that what I'm trying to argue is that we have a political system that was built on top of the foundation of a social social conditions, social, a, a social architecture that has begun for the first time to slip away. What's so remarkable about Tocqueville is that this element that he described, this uh, social foundation of a township, exists from colonial villages to frontier towns. People think it's going to disappear when we move into cities, but then that same township architecture reemerges in urban neighborhoods and in first ring suburbs. And it's only now, over the course of the last few decades, that we have begun to invest our time and attention not in the middle rings, but in these outer and inner rings. The question um, is what are the effects? So the, and I, I want to talk only briefly, um, so I'm fearful of going over my time. There are uh, two, 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 beyond the, the political ramifications, which I've sort of br briefly outlined, I want to I wanna make two, two, two additional points about the shift. The first is about innovation. And I suspect that folks who are regulars at, at events like these at Politics and Prose have heard a theory of innovation that revolves less around, that, that, that tries to disprove the general thesis that big ideas come sort of like a bolt of lightning, because they don't. The history of big ideas is that they come at the intersection of different older ideas. So Gutenberg was certainly brilliant, but really what he did wasn't to imagine the printing press for the first time. He took several existing technologies, ink, paper, movable type, a press, and he put them together in a new way. Same way, the same thing happened with the iPhone, right? The iPhone is not, is not by itself. Uh, it, it, Steve Jobs didn't just come up with the iPhone. He took several existing technologies and put them together in a new way. The great thing about the middle rings was that they incubated exactly that sort of interaction between people who had different ideas and different thoughts. So when we think of innovation today, we tend to think about Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is where people who have computer engineering degrees and other technological skills all come together and meet and talk and have lattes of different colors, but they're basically coming, <laughs> coming together with generally the same frame of reference. A hundred years ago, the vanguard of innovation in the United States wasn't Silicon Valley, it was Detroit. Detroit became the motor city not because there was a surfeit of car engineers, the car hadn't been invented yet. It became that because there were carriage manufacturers, engine designers, and shipbuilders who were building ships for the Great Lakes. And together, those different people who were interacting in the middle rings were talking to each other with some regularity, having conversations, and they came up with a new big idea. Today, we've adopted a different t t innovation model. And there are advantages and disadvantages but we should at least recognize the difference. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of the distinction is that we built a social safety net that presumed that the middle rings would exist beneath the institutions that we're all aware of. So let me give you an example. When Medicare and Medicaid and the programs that we're all familiar with were born through the course of the 20th century. They were built on the assumption that the medical community would provide sort of very specific interventions at certain times in a person's life when they needed help. 
So you'd have a heart attack, you'd go into a hospital, you'd be helped uh, uh, back into better health, and you'd be sent home. And there you'd be cared for by your family, your neighbors, people that you knew. Today, many of these acute conditions that we uh, that, that were uh, that that were the bane of of, uh, of elderly life in the 20th century have been, for the most part, not cured, but they are no longer quite the issue. And we've developed to the point where we're living longer and finding that we are having to deal with chronic disease. Well, chronic disease is not something that you can have a big institution like a hospital or nursing home take care of immediately. You don't have Alzheimer's, go in, get repaired, and so be sent home. These are a, it's a, a different sort of challenge. And it's a challenge that the institutions of hospitals and nursing homes aren't properly addressed currently to take care of. What would happen if we had middle ring relationships was that there'd be a confluence of care. You'd have these institutions providing some sorts of care, but then you'd come back into uh, into the home and you'd have neighbors to take care of you, as was the case throughout American history when there were middle rings. Today, our frustration that the medical community is either too expensive or that the system isn't working is built on the fact that we're asking these institutions that were built to take care of one sort of problem to take care of something that's very different. And that absent these middle, the foundation of these middle ring relationships, the medical community feels like it's falling apart, or at least isn't up to, uh, up to up to the demands. If you put all these things together, you begin to see a picture that begins to explain what George Packer called last year the unwinding. You begin to see that, or you begin it begins to feel, and you, this harkens back to my father's question: What are you guys doing down there? Everything seems like it's 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 broken. The government isn't working. Economic growth is down. Our entitlements are out of control, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes on and on. And it's very hard to understand what's happening. Wh why is it, wh what's going on? Our tendency, of course, is to look at each individual problem and try to diagnose it. In politics, it's the filibuster, the gerrymander. In the economy, it's the there's too much greed on Wall Street or uh, a variety of other complaints about, about in business. And there's, similarly, there's very specific complaints about what's happening in, the, in our social safety net. The odd thing is, if we will all woke up tomorrow and, and saw on the news that half the buildings in Boston, Seattle, San Diego, and Miami had been painted lime green, we wouldn't go to each of those cities and think, I wonder what happened here in Boston that painted everything lime green, and not say, what has happened in all of these different realms of American life that's changed? The thing that's changed is that our core social architecture has changed. That's what's beneath all of this. The question, of course, then is, what do we do about it? And it seems to me that there are essentially three possibilities. I was on Diane Rehm today and uh, had a long interview, and somebody tweeted at me. It was a guy who has built s software that will allow you to meet your neighbors. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so it seems entirely possible that future generations, to my mind, will be desperate to meet people who live nearby them who aren't necessarily part of their core network or part of their affinity group. That's one possibility. The second possibility is that we build here in America institutions that are properly calibrated to the social architecture that we've now generated. That we find ways to make the, the, the economy work using the Silicon Valley model of innovation rather than the Detroit model. That we find ways to uh, fix the political system so that we've got, um, uh, we've got, you know, a Congress and a, and, a, and, a, and a presidency that work collaboratively together once again. Um, that, we, that we build new ways to take care of old people and infirm people uh, that don't require the sort of middle ring 
relationships uh, of old. But barring those two possibilities, there are two things that we can do to at least make it possible that the middle rings will be right reconstituted. The first is to build additional opportunities, um, additional opportunities for people to meet one another. So, for example, uh, we all think of AmeriCorps and City Year as a program that uh, uh, allows young people to, take, to, to, to volunteer in their communities. But in fact, the 18 months that someone works on a City Year project are 18 months that they spend building bridges with the people who are also in their program. And if that experience is one that is done between someone from Louisiana and someone from New York and someone from Washington State and someone from California, people that otherwise wouldn't meet, that's a blessing. And we ought to try to expand opportunities for future generations to do that. The second thing, the second strategy that I think would be helpful, and it's actually something that I, I learned a lot about in a talk by Paul Tuff right here in this room, uh, who wrote How Children Succeed, is that if we can imbue future generations with more what, what he terms grit or character or self-control, that's the core ingredient that's required to build a middle ring relationship. Because when you stumble across somebody who has a different point of view or is a Republican and you're a Democrat or, well, it's Washington, so we'll just leave it at that, um, uh, then, then, then the likelihood that you're able to continue to engage with them depends on your ability to stifle the impulse to lash out. And so if, if the, and this is, this is right at the vanguard of what's happening in the world of education research, we're learning how to, pro to provide young people and actually older people, adolescents and older people, that, that very sort of, that skill. And it turns out that it's fascinating research, and I hope you'll read about it in the book, that whether you're able to, to withstand an impulse is twice as powerful in determining your GPA as your IQ. So this is, this is sort of really meaty stuff. At the end of the day, I think that one of these three solutions will, will actually prevail. I, I feel fairly confident that there'll be some combination that people will begin to use software to meet their neighbors or they'll meet them organically, uh, that we will build, build institutions, and you, you can see it, there are all sorts of examples in America of institutions being built despite the dysfunction of Washington, despite the, the slow growth of the economy, and that we will learn over time to, uh, to put to, to provide more opportunity for these sorts of relationships to be built and, and give people the impetus uh, to, build, to build them. That being said, I think the, what I hope is the powerful element of this book is that it gives people some sort of perspective on the unwinding, that rather than us go around saying to one another, oh, the American age is over, look what's happening, here's an, one example, here's another, that at least understanding why it feels like things are unwinding, we can begin to imagine ways out. So that's why I wrote the book. It was basically to answer that question my father used to ask me each time I went, returned home. And I hope you'll read it and, uh, and you'll feel somewhat satisfied as well. So thank you. So this was great. Um, and I heard you want over here. Yeah. And I heard you on Diane Reem this morning. Um, I should say I'm a primary care physician, and the chronic disease business is a little more complicated than I think you realize. We have two models. One is, is the for-profit model, and the other is the developing community organizations model. You can tell which one I'm, I'm for. And if you want to talk about it more, we can talk offline. Mm -hmm. um, but my Great. question is, um, nobody talks about work. And that's where most people spend most of their time these days. And that's where they have most of their relationships. Mm -hmm. I knew people that, I mean, now I have to work from home, and I don't really enjoy it. But Big change. Yes. And it's unfortunate, but that's the economy. Um, but that's where people have their relationships. And maybe, I don't know if you consider those middle ring relationships. Outside of Washington, people are not necessarily organized by political party. Mm -hmm. You know, they work for companies that, that manufacture things or sell things or mm -hmm. provide services or whatever. So you might get different kinds of people, and certainly at different levels you'll get different kinds of people, workers, management, executives. Right, right. So 
why, first of all, why didn't anyone talk about work as a social setting mm -hmm. this morning? And how does it fit into your uh, uh, cosmology yeah. of Saturn? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's an excellent question. The, uh, I, I can't answer the first question as to why no one spoke about it. I guess you didn't call in, so, so, so no, ne I next never, time. They never, I never get in. You know, <laughs> the, th I think it's helpful here to think about your work environment or your children's work environment or, or, the, or my generation's, the, the environment where we work compared to where my grandfather worked. My grandfather was in the sock business. He had a small not exactly a mill, but he had a he had a, a, a facility outside of Cincinnati. He had in that f facility he had people who were management, right. he had in-house lawyers, he had people who were selling the stuff, he had people who were packing the stuff. It was a whole environment of people right. from different interactions who were class. Those were classic middle ring relationships. Right. In the service economy, you don't generally have in each in each environment places where people from different stations are all sitting together, or, or at least having meals together in the caf cafeteria, mm -hmm. right? In the service economy, you have a wide range of people who generally have, are, are of similar, similar standpoints all together, so that there is, a, there is an element that you, as you move from a manufacturing economy to a service economy, that the social interactions at work are very different. Um, and so that, to the degree you do have middle ring relationships, and I think you'll find, in fact, that in many cases, people who are in in the, in in cubicles, uh, mm -hmm. in office buildings now, are having fewer water cooler conversations mm -hmm. than than were had two generations ago because they're caught up on email or they're in in the spare time that they have, they're checking Facebook or they're texting with their spouses, whatever it is. Uh, that that in each of those environments, it, it's not that the people don't have any middle ring relationships anymore. It's that the amount of time and attention that each individual has is spent more heavily on the inner and the outer relationships. And I think that happens at work as well as in other environments. Thank you. I guess, I'm, I, guess I wanna continue this, the um, inner ring inquiry here. I, it's, yeah. a, it's a concept that um, seems reasonable, uh, but I always It's a first feel step. I always feel better when I can bring data to bear on uh, on concepts. Yeah. Um, if I get it correctly, the sort of basic premise is that the inner ring, I mean, sorry, middle ring relationships of, say, 1950 or 55 were qualitatively different than uh, the relationships that we have now. Um, the inner ring then being defined by neighbors or bowling leagues or Boy Scouts or um, whatever clubs, country clubs, mm -hmm. and now by Facebook friends and um, Twitter contacts and so forth, as well as maybe professional um, mm -hmm. groups, right? Uh, that where we keep in touch with people electronically rather than uh, face to face. So has and it seems like the basic concept is a diversity of the um, the middle ring community that we had in the mid-century or whatever was more diverse, at least in class terms and in, in uh, political sort of view terms than our contacts are now? Our, you're yeah, describing I, well, our contacts now through Facebook or whatever as, I don't know if you're thinking of those as middle ring or not middle ring, but it, my, qu my question is, um, has anybody brought any data to bear on whether what is the diversity in terms yeah. of any of the dimensions of people's right. Facebook uh, friends now in comparison to what the diversity looked like for people's experience of the mid-century? Right. Well, it, asking me about data is a is a is is smart because si 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 simply because the f my great frustration. I've been working on this book for seven years. My great frustration was that it's almost impossible to find data that lines up exactly with what I'm trying to say, which is that each of us individually has a certain fund of social capital. It's, my, it's slightly different from the way Robert Putnam uses the term, but each of us has a certain amount of time and attention, and we are investing it in cer certain relationships and not in others. And that whether we are actively choosing or not, whether it's being chosen just because of the rhythms of our everyday life, we are in, we're investing them in different sorts of relationships. It's a, 
There's no perfect way to measure that. You can have people self-report. There's some time use data that begins in the 90s so that you can't really compare over time. The best data I could find, I found midway through the project in a conversation I had with, a, with the Dean of Social Sciences at Harvard, who said he had looked at the general social survey and found three questions. Questions were, well, he, the, the question was this. Who have you socialized with over the course of the previous month? The percentage of Americans who had said that they had socialized with one member of their family has gone up over the course of the last few decades. The percentage of Americans who say they've socialized with, with a friend who lives several miles away has also gone up. The percentage who say they have socialized with a neighbor has dropped. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of then anecdotal data that you'll find in the book. The percentage of Americans today, of adult Americans who are in touch weekly with, their, with a parent, has gone up by th from 32 to 42 percent. Right? The percentage of Americans who live, adults who are between the ages of 21 and 30, who live with their parents, has gone up from 11 to 20 percent. So you can see evidence that, that people are investing more heavily in the inner rings and, and less in the middle rings. The second part of your question, which is a, which is a great one which is, are these outer ring relationships, isn't it possible that these outer ring relationships are actually more diverse than the middle ring relationships? Is, wouldn't it seem intuitive that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a Cincinnati Bengals fan, a, a Caucasian Cincinnati Bengals fan, and there's an African-American Cincinnati Bengals fan who lives in Seattle, and we're both on the same blog talking about the Cincinnati Bengals, that would appear at first glance, to be evidence of greater diversity. In fact, we probably don't even know each other's names, right? We we just we just on the same blog. We're talking to one another, so that is that's actually an affinity group. If we if it was a middle ring relationship, the two of us might meet at a bar. We talk about the Cincinnati Bengals, and suddenly, you know, some the news would come on, and we'd start having a conversation about something else. That's a that's a authentically diverse experience. We're really exchanging views about things that we don't necessarily agree about. In the outer rings, if that guy turned out to be a Cleveland Browns fan, God forbid, <laughs> I'd immediately dismiss him, right? And go back to finding someone, uh, someone who, who agreed with me. So that's, that, that's the distinction that I'm trying to make. Uh, thank you, I realize that I'm standing next to a water cooler, so I guess we're having a- Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm wondering if we might broaden this a bit, and I haven't read your book, so can't really say, but a lot of what you describe does not only apply, it seems to me, to American society. There is, if you can call it global, you can call it a broader disaffection, for example, in the democratic world. Another, so a lot of the phenomena you describe, even if some of them, as mm -hmm. Tocqueville correctly noted, were top-down, class-oriented societies, it's something that goes beyond just simply our traditional structures and affects politics and social life and human interactions all across the globe. So there's a larger phenomenon here. I don't know whether your book went into this at all or not, but it seems to me we can't define right. it, excuse me, exclusively in American terms. Well, the, the, the dream is that readers around the world want to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's a given. So, That's a so given. For, yeah, right, from yeah, your yeah, comment yeah. to God's ears. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, the point I wanted to make was that there is a symbiosis between the social structure of American life and these institutions that we've built on it. It doesn't mean that the same phenomenon isn't happening elsewhere. And I think it's, it's, it's a worthy second book, and mm -hmm. my agent is here, and maybe, maybe afterwards <laughs> okay. she and I will discuss whether that's what the follow-up should be. But the, the issue is that we are, we, are, we are at a moment where nearly every conversation, broad conversation about America suggest that things are unwinding, that things are, are spinning out of control. And I hope that this book provides people some sort of solace mm -hmm. or some sort of explanation mm -hmm. that connects the dots. It's certainly true that the same technological changes, suburbanization, digitalization, the advent of the service economy, the fact that we're mo all moving up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. which is right in the book, mm -hmm. that that is going to affect things all over the place. And there was a moment several years ago, too many years ago, when I thought maybe this book should be about something that's happening in the broader world. Mm -hmm. In the end, I wanted to bring it back to this 
the, what I wanted to, I wanted to identify for people an epic mismatch between these institutions and the foundation, the, the social the social architecture below them. And so I, I you're absolutely right. It's a slightly different conversation, and I hope that I can answer that in some good. Thank you, future forum. Right. Sure, thanks. Hi. Um, I, I realize that you're kind of dealing in generalities here. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the dangers of being an average white guy is that you miss some of the diversity. Uh, for example, my neighborhood, which is out here in the suburbs of Montgomery mm -hmm. County, which classically people think is, yeah, the sort of anonymous, bland community. I mean, our elementary school in our uh, neighborhood is 35% Hispanic, and yet I know six families that have moved within the neighborhood because they needed a bigger house because they were having kids, but they didn't want to leave the ties in their mm -hmm. neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are these kinds of communities that exist, and Sorry. urban planners and elected officials have a term for this, which they call NIMBYs, that I think a lot of urban policy basically doesn't recognize the sense of community and in fact it has done a lot to destroy those kinds of communities where they've existed because they want to make places or build communities like the new urbanists do who wouldn't know community if it fell on them like Dorothy's house and the Wizard of Oz <laughs> because they only relate to the physicality of the mm -hmm. environment not to the social networks that exist mm -hmm. and I think that yeah as the one previous speaker talked about, that's one of the things is lacking measurements that uh, would indicate this kind of thing. Uh, the one person I have seen do this is David Wilson with the State University of New York at Binghamton that uh, surveyed the entire city school children on pro-sociality attitudes and behaviors and then mapped this out to show that there in fact are differences in terms of level of pro-social behaviors in the different neighborhoods and that this was further than echoed in terms of how uh, people decorated their homes during holidays, that the pro-social neighborhoods had more decorations. He did experiments with his grad students of the uh, dropping the letter on the street to see whether or not people would uh, actually pick them up and put them in the mailbox and whatnot. And not a big surprise, the pro-social neighborhoods, the more of these letters would get returned. Uh, but he then also resurveyed these children a couple years later. And the other thing that he found interesting here was that the children, if they moved between neighborhoods, the attitudes would change. And the more pro social kids would become less so if they moved to a less pro social neighborhood. And so there are, I think, those kinds of influences there, and they are measurable. But what we're sadly lacking is any indicators that uh, will tell public officials where we do have these kinds of strong neighborhoods, strong communities, and those are worth preserving when they're making their plans as far as yeah. when they want to remake cities and whatnot, that you have an asset here that you're not recognizing. Well, uh, yeah, I, I want to be very clear that I'm not saying that there are no middle ring relationships and that there are no townships in America. I'm trying to look at a broad spectrum, right. and, and the experience and the, the the bits of data that I could put together suggest that there is this major shift away. Mm -hmm. uh, Lewis Mumford, in the beginning of the 20th century, began looking at the history of American community and started started talking about it in waves. That we had we had made these major transitions from from the east to west and from from the farm to the city and and whatnot. And he he, he thought that the that the term wave was particularly apt because it when when, when a wave comes press over the previous wave, but doesn't mean that the, the, the previous existence goes out, is, is eliminated altogether. So just in the same way we move from farm to factory over the course of the, of the 19th century, it doesn't mean there are no farms anymore. Right. So, so but that, that, that's absolutely a fair point. But that there may be a need for a more nuanced urban policy to recognize these kinds of assets. I, I, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely right, that, that there's, I mean, there are a whole variety of, of schools on this. One thing, just to respond directly to that point, one of the things that I found hopeful, there's a book out called The Great American City by Robert Sampson, who's a sociologist at Harvard. He looked at Chicago. What he found was that we tread, tend to think that a healthy neighborhood is a, is a neighborhood where people all know one another. But of course, middle ring relationships include gangs, right? There are all sorts of unhealthy middle ring relationships. The thing that actually determines in many cases whether a neighborhood is healthy, whether whether crime is rampant or there, there are healthy social behaviors, is what he terms collective, equi co collective efficacy. And what that means is whether or not you know your neighbor, that you know how to solve a problem collectively 
whether or not they're strangers. So if there's an intersection that needs a stop sign, you know how to, how to get that stop sign, even if you don't know the person who lives next door. And so when people say, you know, if we don't have middle-ring relationships, isn't, isn't, isn't that further evidence that America's falling apart? What I say is there are ways to adjust. And the, 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 the brilliance of the American neighborhood, the, 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 core, the core element that we want to preserve doesn't need to exist as it existed in previous generations. There are different ways for us to build these connections that, are, that make, make cities and communities and towns vibrant. Or preserve the ones that are. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. Uh, I just kind of have two comments on things people previously asked about. Uh, in regards to the international broader political discontent, um, yeah. I think it's important to realize that at the time when Tocqueville was talking about the top-down societies, uh, those, for the most part, no longer exist because our version of democracy and you know the versions of democracy uh, in France, et cetera, have been spread around the world. So I would say that a lot of this middle ring relationships falling out uh, would be applicable because now these societies have these institutions built upon mm -hmm. um, middle, middle ring society. Second point, just adding to some data. I don't know if uh, The Economist recently had a piece on parenting and it was pretty illuminating. I thought that working mothers today spend more time with their children than house, yeah, house moms in the right. 60s. Um, so I would assume part of the time that the house moms in the 60s, uh, that they weren't spent with their children, were spent socializing with the neighborhood, so. Yeah, well, I've, that, that's a, b both, both very thoughtful points. On the, on the, on the, on the former, I, 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 I reserve comment until my next talk at Politics and Prose. Uh, uh, on the second, you're, you're absolutely right, that, that, that the evidence is, for instance, that today, uh, each couple spends 12 hours more each week at work. But that does not necessarily mean that there are fewer hours spent with their children. And in many cases, there's a, there's a sociologist at Berkeley, and I had this conversation with him, and his general point of view is that people come to him with some great regularity and say, you know, Professor, I found a huge change in American community. And he says, calm down, calm down. You know, th this has actually happened before. He said, you know, the fact that we don't have dinner at home with our kids as much could be a reflection of the fact that we're going out to dinner with our kids as much as it is that we are, that, that we're just, that, that we're not seeing our kids as much. And in, in many cases, people are spending much more time with their children. So it's a, it's, a, it's a point well taken. We spend so much time curating our images online, but also um, living amongst like-minded people these days, um, Democrats with Democrats, independents with independents, and so on. And, and so I'm wondering if at some point in the future those things are going to converge and um, curating our, our images online or on Facebook or on blogs is going to be part of sort of protecting our middle ring relationships, actually. So I have made a very uh, determined decision not to try to predict the future. <laughs> and I don't, even, I, I don't even want to come down on the side of this shift being good or bad. I've been, I was very careful in this book, and I think probably to the frustration of a few readers, that I don't say either things are going to fall apart because we don't have the middle rings, or this, the, the, the new digital age is going to be uh, Shangri-La. I, I want to be very careful about it. I feel like I can say with some accuracy what's happened. I don't know what's going to happen. But I, but I think what you're saying, which is that there would be a new desire to reinvest in these sorts of relationships and new ways for people to connect, whether it's to meet your neighbors over online or, or, or whatever it is, I think that that's very possible. I think that, I mean, let me, let me I, to move away from the data into the anecdotal. My wife and I decided a year ago to move, and the primary thing that we wanted was to find a street where we would know our neighbors. And if and if and if we're you know if we're a sample of of a much larger group, that it may be that future generations that our kids or that other younger people here in the future will find ways to meld online and uh, bricks and mortar life uh, in a way that is that it that is 
that generates more interactions between people who have different points of view. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, yeah, just a quick one. I, I think I heard you say that the third solution or where there may be great potential was in character, building character and yeah. self-control even. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could just expand on that. Um, yeah. So I'll bet that, I'll, that a bunch of folks here in the crowd have heard of the marshmallow test, which is this test that's given to young people, and you put, it, put, put a marshmallow in front of a four-year-old, and you say, you can eat the marshmallow at any time, uh, but if you don't eat the marshmallow, uh, I'll come back with a second marshmallow, and you can eat both of them. And those that eat the marshmallow immediately are nowhere near uh, as successful in life on a whole variety of indicators as those who are able to withstand the impulse to eat that first marshmallow so that they can get the second. And there's all sorts of data about self-control. There's a great study of, of, of a population over time in, I think it's Dunedin, New Zealand, where they looked at, at folks at, at a young age and they tracked them through their 40s, and they looked at those who were young and were able to withstand the impulse, had, had greater measures of self-control, were wildly more successful, were, uh, were healthier, were, uh, were less, less likely to have been wrapped up in the criminal justice system compared to those who, who had less self-control. The, the argument that I'm trying to make here is that it's that very skill that allows or empowers someone to build a middle ring relationship. That if, you don't, if you're not able to withstand the impulse when someone says, oh, you know, I really think that Sarah Palin is great. If you're able to withstand the impulse say, oh my God, <laughs> right? You're halfway towards building a middle ring relationship that you otherwise wouldn't have, right? So I, I'm, I'm a little surprised that you have not addressed the economics, the economics of this. Uh, what is the impact of uh, the, 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 the chasm that, has, you know, that is increasing between uh, a small number of people mm -hmm. with the digitized, urbanized world who are becoming extremely rich uh, and uh, the middle class is you know, disappearing, and I would say the middle class probably was a very important part of that middle ring that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Would you please speak about this? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I find so ironic about the conversation we have about social mobility in the United States is the fact that while we are less, more, more economically stratified than we've been in a long time, by many measures we're much things are much more fluid on a whole range of other issues. So today, if you're a homosexual and you want to get married, the, the odds are in mo much of the country that you'll actually be able to live your own sexuality. The, 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 the divisions of race have, have, have diminished. On, across a whole variety of, of, of American life, it turns out that social mobility, by, by sort of a broader definition, is way up. Economic inequality is absolutely grown, uh, and and I my my tendency is in the, you know I have to read the book to to get the, the full flavor of the argument, but the, my tendency is to believe that it, that we should be viewing this as how has this change in social architecture and the way it's affected the economy begun to drive economic inequality rather than looking at looking at from the from the from the standpoint of here here is this this problem of economic equality how is it affecting our social lives look at it the other way and you know it's interesting I, I've, I've frequently gone and asked people who are in the world of finance in particular why is it that the salaries on Wall Street today are, are so crazy why, why is it that by comparison the CEO of someone at, at, a, at a hedge fund today is so much greater than it is uh, in proportion to what it was three generations ago and the, the first answer is greed, right? That's always, I mean, that's, that, that's the, the, for those who are sympathetic to that being a concern, that's, but if you think about that, it's not that, <laughs> it's not that the folks on Wall Street four generations ago didn't desire money. So what is the thing that's changed? I've never gotten a good answer to that question. And if there's someone in the audience that, 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 that knows, please come and talk to me uh, uh, after I'm through here, because I'm, I'm curious about it. I suspect, if I think about it long enough and I've begun to piece together that there's some element of a, a modicum of 
uh, of, of reasonableness that comes from having frequent interactions in these middle rings where you're meeting people who have different points of view and that that would temper what you thought was a reasonable salary or reasonable income. Uh, and that absent those sorts of relationships, now I, I can't prove any of this. And for the, for, to, the, to the gentleman who asked me about data, like, please, th this is conjecture. Um, but but that is, that's how I've begun to think about it. Um, so it, that you may buy it, you may not. Um, but, if, but if anybody has an answer to this sort of existential question of why things have gotten so bad, I'm, I mean, let me introduce you to my agent. Um, yeah. Bill Bishop has this book, The Big Sort, um, yeah, great which book. right, which hits on a lot of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. of people um, are choosing to live uh, near similar people, right. and then it you know weakens community because yep. you don't have those sort of middle ties. So I'm curious what you think about that, and then also that book would seem to suggest that people are consciously choosing to you know live in a way that destroys these middle ties that you're talking about. So I'm curious. You know, we're all sympathetic to your point of view. We're all at a book talk for your book. <laughs> I'm curious what, you know, when you talk to people who, you know, haven't necessarily thought about this or at least don't think in the same way, what kind of reaction do you get? Right. So, so let, me, let me take those two, two parts of the question. The first part is Bill Bishop had an argument that people were sorting themselves out so that you'd see a 1984 Volvo, with a with a peace sign on it you'd, in a neighborhood, and you're you're a you're an old liberal, and you'd move into that neighborhood rather than one that had a lot of pickup trucks. My argument's a little bit different in that it doesn't. It almost. I, I think Bill's right. I mean, I, th I think that's a pretty compelling argument. I think the evidence is 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 overwhelming. There's a distinction though between having have having a neighbor who thinks like you do, and having a neighbor who you don't know, right? So that you could be living amidst people who are, who, who have a whole variety of different points of view. But if you get home at five o'clock each night, drive your car into the garage, close the door, come on, come inside, feed your kids, and then get online, you're never having that interaction. And that's that's so that that's the distinction between what Bill was arguing, and what I'm arguing. Um, the interesting part of this experience for me, and hopefully I'll get to give talks like this in at bookstores around the country or, or other places I have conversations with people who aren't all from Northwest or fr fr from the Washington area. Uh, uh, the, the, interesting, the interesting part is that what I found is that whenever you s describe these rings of Saturn to people and you ask people to compare their social life to the social life their grandparents had or their social life to, to what their kids have, almost everybody feels this difference. There's almost no one who says, no, 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 no. I've got, I've got very strong middle rings, and my, and my grandparents uh, had. So, so that's, uh, in fact, the, the most fun I've had with this is that almost in every interaction I have, I describe this, and someone has a story of their own. Their, their grandmother was very involved in a club or their grandfather, whatever it is. And that's very gratifying. And that, that spans the, the political spectrum. So great question.